value the changing of the seasons, the coming of the spring, the renewal of our world, time when we get out and get refreshed and return to so many activities that we have put aside during the colder times. We're thankful for the, the wonderful blessing that you've given us in this world, the marvels as we see the engineering that you put into our creation and the place that we live. <coughs> we thank you for these great things around us. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come here on this Lord's Day as your church gathers together, as we celebrate the fellowship that we have with you and your son, the hope we have of eternal life. We look forward to the things that are to come and the promises that you've made to us. Father, we're thankful for the time that we have to be here at this place for our time and study. We pray that you'll bless us as we study together from your word. Father, we're mindful of the many that we've discussed this morning and their needs, and circumstances of their lives. We pray that you will watch over our family, our church family, and those that we've discussed this morning and provide for the needs that they have. We ask that you will continue to bless Johnny's family and the passing of Sister Ruby. We ask that you will comfort them and strengthen them in their lives. Father, we're grateful for those who've been returned to us. We're mindful of those who are still out. We pray your blessings on Pat Wyatt, that you will help her to continue to recover and be back in her place before long. Father, we ask that you will help us as we have opportunity to help others, that we will see them return to us. We continue to think about Tom and Sandra and their, their absence from us. We pray that you will watch over them and provide for them the needs that they have. Father, we ask that you will bless Brother Carroll, that you will um, provide for him and the needs that are ongoing in his life. Father, we are surrounded by the changes in life, and they are often traumatic. And we sometimes are unaware, and sometimes there's not much we can do. Chip and Kelly are away from us and have many, many things laid upon their shoulders at this time. We ask that you will provide for them and strengthen them. Father, bring them back to us safely and watch over their family and the needs that, that are in each of their lives that they will be provided for and that they will be returned to a reasonable amount of health. Father, we ask that you go with us through this week. Watch over us, provide for us, forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 3. I know you thought I said I was going to say two, but <laughs> Acts chapter 3 is where we will start this morning. Acts chapter 2 has brought us through the creation of the church. The church has begun. Um, and now what are we going to see happen? In the beginning they were all Jews. And so these are all Jewish people who have a fulfillment of Old Testament of of Old Testament uh, the word I was going to use does not appropriately fit here uh, I was going to say destiny but that is not the case uh, because that has a, uh, a, a different background and history they have fulfilled the Old Testament expectation uh, of bringing the people of God to the place where the Messiah would meet them. And that was the role of the Old Testament, to prepare people for God. And now Jesus has come, has introduced that uh, message last week, uh, I mean, uh, in Acts chapter 2, in the last chapter, and um, that now has been spread and is spreading. And in Jesus they are now beginning they are happy, they are unified, uh, they are um, they, they recognize that they have a new belonging, a, a new place, uh, they are strongly promoting the gospel to attract others, and so this is a really unique time uh, right here. So now what? What happens next? Well, 
That's where we begin in chapter 3 and our narrative picks up again. And uh, so will our pace. Uh, because we do not have the, uh, the doctrinal discussions that, uh, that will um, need to be done quite so much. All right, chapter 3. We have two scenes that are going to unfold. First is uh, the event that's going to bring attention to uh, the group. And then we're going to have the Peter's response, which is going to be a sermon. Um, and then in chapter 3, the attention of the um, leaders is going to be brought to what's taking place. All of this is happening in the temple. Uh, so the Jewish leaders are aware of what's going on. And, and now what is this commotion? Who, who is this and what are they doing? Well, they're going to draw some attention and the response of that leadership and the interaction that's going to be there. And we're going to go through some fighting for a while and then break into Acts chapter 7 with the uh, killing of Stephen. Acts chapter 8, the war breaks out uh, with uh, rampant persecution and Saul of Tarsus. And then we're going to convert Saul, and then we're going to, and then we're going to, and now we're off on a run in, Acts, in the book of Acts. All right, so Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Um, Peter and John, Peter and John, two of the three, inner circle of Jesus, whenever Jesus got together with his little group and there was a special little group there, who was involved in the little group? <clears throat> Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John, we sometimes refer to as the inner three, the closest of Jesus' disciples. Interestingly enough, who is the first apostle to die. James. James, brother of John, one of Jesus' closest uh, group, one of the pair of the sons of thunder, that was James and John. So Peter and John going up to the temple. Uh, why would they go to the temple if they're Christians? They're still in the Old Testament rigor. They are Jews. Yeah. The fact that this has as it has begun, uh, will not separate immediately. All right, let's say this is our path, and this is going to come up to um, this path is going to lead off eventually and separate. And uh, these are going to be the non converts. And we'll call this the converts. And there will be a gradual separation of these paths, but it is not a, an immediate break. Okay? So the Jews, both converted and non-converted, are going to continue. Actually, these are going to continue in fellowship with those for quite some time. This is going to go along until the spread becomes much greater. And eventually, there will be a recognition that we're not the same anymore. But right now... There's a, a transition period. So this, this transition has some, uh, some old and new mixed together. All Jews. All right, Peter, ninth hour. When is the ninth hour? Three o'clock. How do you know? Where does the Bible tell us that? They didn't start until the sun came up. In the morning, it's six hours later. Jewish day, generally speaking, don't, don't you know, write this in stone. Generally speaking, we think of sunrise as the beginning of the Jewish day, not the beginning of the Jewish... Day. Rephrase. <laughs> beginning of the Jewish daylight. The Jewish day had night and day. When we think of our day, we think of day and night, although we really shouldn't because our day begins when? At midnight, 12 at, 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 in the darkness. So go figure. But we still say uh, it's the beginning of the day, right? Have you ever tried to tell someone uh, about uh, when an event took place and it was at 4 o'clock in the morning? How did you describe it? What day did it happen? Uh, or 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, sometimes we'll have a, a challenge with that. We have to, have to phrase it in that way in order to describe it. Well, 
The Jewish night began at sunset. That was the beginning of their quote unquote day, their 24 hour period. And so your night goes first and then as the day breaks, the day will end at sunset. So this is the beginning of the day time. Uh, usually we think of that about six o'clock. When Peter in Acts chapter 11, excuse me, in Acts chapter two, says it is too early for these men to be drunk. They're not drunk as you suppose because it is only the third hour of the day, which we said would have been approximately nine o'clock in the morning. So this is the ninth hour. What happened at the ninth hour in the temple? It says it's, it's prayer time. Why did they go to the temple to pray? This was the time of the afternoon sacrifice. Morning, afternoon, and evening sacrifices were made to God in the temple. This would have been the time of the afternoon sacrifice, and many of the people went to pray in the temple while that's taking place. It is the time of prayer. Peter and John are going up at the ninth hour. Verse 2, and a certain lame man, excuse me, a certain man lame, from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple. All right, what do we know about the man? What are the facts? Tell me all the facts you know about this guy. Lame from birth. Lame. Lame from birth. He is lame. He has been that way since birth. He's a beggar, I say. He is a beggar. He went to the temple where a lot of people get together to get money. Okay, so if you're a beggar, you need to be put. He can't walk, so someone has got to take him, carry him there. He is carried daily and put in the place where a large number of Jewish people will pass by, knowing that this is a man who cannot take care of himself and others will provide for him in some way. So he sits there asking people to provide for him. Great job. Any of you want to take, take his place? Not me, thank you very much. No, that's, this is not something you would desire. This is a, a place. Now, what else was wrong with him? I mean, was he like retarded? Was he, uh, the, he uh, uh, handicapped in some other way? All we know about him is that he, had, that he was lame. He couldn't walk, couldn't work. So imagine being a normal person who is unable to provide for yourself. That would be a devastating uh, challenge to deal with in life and from birth. So his whole life he's done nothing. Well, this is the only life he's known. It is. How old is he? I don't know. They say man. So he's not. So obviously he's been around for a bit. Now, boy, <laughs> he's the lame man. How old is he? It doesn't say. Eh, wrong answer. <laughs> You're right, but you're not. It doesn't say here how old he was. Does it say where, anywhere else how old he was? Where? Try chapter 4, verse 22. 40 years old. I'd say it's about 40, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's over 40. Good answer. <laughs> More than 40 years old. More than 40 years old. Okay, so this was not a young man. This is a middle-aged man, at least. Um, if we do statistically, he's past middle age. Uh, but anyway, so this is not a boy. This is a grown man, and um, he has spent his whole life begging um, which means, what did he not do as in life? Well, he didn't do anything. So here he is. And um, so this is his life. He's laid daily at the, the gate, which is called Beautiful. Which gate is that of the temple? We don't know. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about it. The, uh, the winning argument is that the gate that was uh, donated by one of the rich Jews, uh, it was made of Corinthian brass, is the one that most people assume was the one they called beautiful. But uh, what is a gate? 
in referring to either a wall or a building of this this century? Cement It's a door. So when you talk about a, a, a gate, if you have a wall, uh, these would have been the big doors that opened. They would have been, depending on which gate you're talking about, uh, dozens of feet high. So these were huge uh, openings in the in the walls that uh, could be open and closed. Okay. Um, all right. So that's where he spent every day. He sat there. He asked alms of everyone who entered. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. So Peter, excuse me, the uh, the lame man makes contact. Here's Peter and John. They're going up. They're not going. They're not in the temple yet. This is not going into the temple. <laughs> building. This is going into the temple property. This is the this the wall that surrounds all of the temple complex and it was um, you probably have a picture in the back of your Bible if you have a printed Bible that will show you what the temple looked like along with the courtyard surrounding it. Uh, this is not going in where the priest went to the to the holy place where sacrifices are made. This would have been into the courtyard. So this is going up into, and it would have been a large open area uh, outside, and uh, this is where he was. Peter and John are going up there. Clearly, they're going up to pray. Uh, ninth hour, and he says, uh, you know, alms for the poor? I don't know. Uh, gentlemen, you got any money? I don't know. But he called out to them. He saw them... Verse 4, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. Now, why did he say that? He wanted his attention. Um, what was it about Peter and John that was unique? Maybe nothing. They would have been just two ordinary Jewish guys walking up to the temple. Would they have been lavishly dressed? Certainly not. They would have been in very plain, ordinary clothing. Both Peter and John were working men. They had grown up hard. They were fishermen. They would have been uh, exposed to the sun. They would have been toughened by weather. They had lived a hard life, a working man's life. These were just normal working guys from the region of Galilee. These guys were not raised up in a, an easy life. Uh, they would have just been uh, normal folk. Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Okay, you've called out to me. Uh, look here. What was he expecting to get? Money. Money. That's what he was expecting to get. What did he get? Verse 6. Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. Does that mean Peter was broke, penniless? No. No, it doesn't. He said, you know, we're not rich guys. I'm not going to give you money. Well, then, so what? Why, why are you calling my attention? Peter and gold, silver and gold have I none, but... What I do have, I give you. What did Peter have? Peter has something a lot more valuable than silver and gold. What would silver and gold have done for this beggar? He continued his lifestyle. He'd have kept him a beggar. He'd have still been a cripple. You know, it may have been provided for him in some way, but he still would have been exactly what he, where he was. What was Peter about to do to him? rock his world. Uh, he, he is just about to be changed completely. What I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the name of. There are going to be a number of times where we find that phrase. In the name of. Go and make disciples and baptize them. In the name of. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said that, what was he describing? To do something in the name of one means that you have the authority. They are the source of what you're doing. They're the reason why you're doing whatever it is you're doing. So Peter says, 
I have something and I'm giving it to you, but it's not mine. I got it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, could there have been anyone else? Maybe. This is going to be some of the first times that that, that statement is going to be made. Jesus of Nazareth up to this point was well known. He was a rabbi. He was a, a prophet. He was known to the people. He had performed miracles. He had done many things for the last few years. And it was only about, what, five weeks ago that Jesus was killed and was raised from the dead. And now the Pentecost has come. The uh, church has begun. Peter's going up to the temple. All of this is still really new. Jesus of Nazareth, but now there's a different word. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus, the Messiah from Nazareth. Now that is a new phrase. That's going to be something that has not happened up to this point and is going to be the beginning of something very new. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk? This guy's been a, a cripple from birth. How is he going to rise up and walk? Verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted up. Now, if you have a guy who's been crippled from birth, and you take hold of him, what's going to happen if you lift him up? He's going to fall. How much does this guy weigh? Who knows? Likely a big, strong, strapping guy? Probably not. He's been sitting his whole life doing nothing. He's probably pretty frail. But... He, uh, Peter, Peter takes hold of him and lifts him. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. It's an interesting phrase right there. When did it happen? Immediately. What happened? He received strength. His bones, his body changed. How? It's impossible. It is impossible. That's so how did it happen? That's a miracle. It is miraculous. And that's one of those things when you come to this point and say, how did this happen? It was the power of God. It was miraculous. But that doesn't happen in the real world. No, it doesn't. That's the whole point of a miracle, is that it could not happen in the normal world. So did it happen? There are two responses to that. You either believe that it did or it did not. If you believe that it did not, then you're denying both the reality of the text and you're denying the preaching that took place. So you're saying that this event did not happen. You are aware that there are a lot of people who say that the miracles of the New Testament did not occur. Okay. Well, if you that's what you believe, then you are denying the testimony of all of those things. On the other hand, if this is true... Which is easier to do, raise someone from the dead or strengthen the uh, legs of a person who was born a cripple? It's not only strengthening. It's not only strengthening. He never learned to walk, so he wouldn't know how to do any of that. No. No. So there's a lot more to it. Yes. Oh, we're not there yet. Yeah. We've got to the good part. <laughs> we're just starting. All right, so Peter lays hands on him, takes his, takes his hand, he begins to lift. What would this guy have thought when Peter starts trying to lift him up? I tell you, walk. Walk? Are you kidding? What's going through this guy's mind? It's a joke. You know, I don't know. You wonder if he felt something when he told him that when he was healed. Mm -hmm. uh, he he killed him. Him. Yeah. Him up. They didn't know Peter. Didn't know Peter and John from Adam. <laughs> He's just two guys going up to the temple. He asked him for money, and the next thing you know, this guy says, I can make stand up. What? 
I'll show you what I can give you. Rise up and walk. I love the confidence behind that. You know, when Peter goes up there and he, he just goes for it. He doesn't him. ask him. You yeah. know, what do you think? He, would you like to walk around the temple today? No, just, I'm going to give you something. Get up. So he, verse 8, leaping up. This wasn't something where, where the guy, you know, gradually they get him up off the ground and, you know, his legs uncurl. Bubba touched Leapt him. off the ground. How would a man who has never walked, never stood, never put feet on the ground leap up? He had to have felt something happen inside of his body that gave him confidence that he could do. He didn't just get up. He didn't just stand up. He leapt up. Leapt up, stood, and walked, and entered the temple with them. And three things are happening. One, he's walking. That's cool. Number two, he is jumping, jumping or leaping. And number three, he is praising God. All right, so he's going along with them. And while, have you ever walked with a four-year-old <laughs> <laughs> through a store or maybe through a museum or something like that and try to hold their hand, you know, and they're, they're jumping over the cracks and, you know, trying to jump on the little, little spots on the, on the floor and, and, you know, you, you There you go. But this guy's 40 years old. Why would he do that? He's excited. This guy's beyond excited. Yeah. Imagine this. His, his life has been changed. He has come into this day with no expectations whatsoever. And now he has just been turned into a normal man. He is, he is able to walk. And what can he do now? And just think what, you know, and people knew him. They've known him for 40 years. He's the guy that's been laying there doing nothing. And now he's he's jumping up and down. He's hanging right on to Peter and John. You think he's going to let those guys go? Not a chance. And what else is he doing? He is shouting to the top of his lungs. He's probably crying tears of joy. Hey, there's all kind of... Com this guy is raising a storm. <laughs> he is causing a scene. If you're trying to do something quietly, this is the opposite of it. Everybody is drawn into what's taking place. Verse 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew, verse 10, it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. How is this guy? We know that's him. We know that's him. What, what's going on here? How can he do this? This is a big deal. What has Peter done? He started a snowball rolling down a, 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 a hill. It's going to be an avalanche. What did he do? Here's what I've got for you. Peter and gold, uh, silver and gold, I have none. But what I do have, I'm going to give. <coughs> Stand up and walk. Boom. Look what happened after that. Now, they're in a public place. They're here where people are praying. It's, it's a religious setting. It's, it's, the temple is there. This is not the kind of activity that normally goes on in the temple. With this guy shouting and leaping and jumping and praising God and all of the commotion that is caused by it. Now all the people are wondering what in the world is going on with this. Verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. Don't you know he did. Held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So this has created a, a scene, a real scene. They all gathered around. Solomon's porch, remember your picture if you looked it up? Along one wall, the long wall, is called Solomon's porch, which had a colonnade of, what, 162 columns? If I remember my... Uh, um, history right and uh, so you're talking about a long open area where you could have put a whole bunch of people and they all come together and what happens when you get a crowd of people together in front of a preacher 
Start it's time to start preaching. Verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? You think this is a big deal? It's nothing. Why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Well, Peter and John, did Peter and John make this man walk? Did Peter and John make this man walk? No. Okay, we got yes and no. Yes, make your case. They did it on earth. They did it. The power that did it by is by God. Okay, who's the no? No, they didn't. It wasn't them. It was in the name of. Yeah. But if it hadn't been for Peter and John there, would this man be walking? They, they were the vessel. Okay, so did Peter and John make this man walk? Yes. yes. <laughs> Did Peter and John make this man walk? No. How can it be both yes and no? It is. Were, did they cause it to happen? Yes, they did. Were they the power and the source behind it? No, they were not. They were the wire connecting the battery to the light bulb. They weren't the battery. They weren't the light bulb. They're the wire connected it. But to the okay? People, to the people there, they made him walk. They didn't see everything. Okay, Peter and John are the conduit through which this has come. So these are the guys that made this man walk. And so first thing Peter does is deny it. He said, we didn't do it. Well, we did it, but we didn't. It's not us. That's important because who got in trouble for not, for trying to take credit for something they didn't do? Moses, Aaron, yeah. Moses it would come to mind immediately. Moses and Aaron, must we bring water for you out of this rock? <laughs> Moses shouldn't have done that. The Lord's been providing all these miracles. You are nothing. And because of that, you're not going into the promised land. So the first thing Peter does is say, we didn't do it. This is not us. Don't look at us like we're anything special. We are not anything special. When John tried to worship the angel in the vision in the revelation, what's the first thing the angel says? Don't do that. <laughs> don't, do that. don't worship me. Uh-uh. That's for God alone. Don't you worship me. When Paul and, and uh, Barnabas end up in a place where they have performed a miracle and the people run among, uh, are among them and they want to make sacrifices to them, what do Paul and, Sil uh, Paul and Barnabas do? They run among them tearing their clothes and say, folks, don't do that. We're just men like you. So first thing Peter does, we didn't do it. This is God's power. Now he's going to explain it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Pilate wanted, you're going to get the whole history here. Pilate wanted to let him go, but the Jews forced Pilate to not let him go. Why did the Jews do that? They were led by the leaders. Who felt threatened. You denied the Holy One, verse 14, and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. 
You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Wow. Peter's second sermon. Brought about because of a miracle. What was the purpose of miracles? Three questions for you. I heard that bell. I don't like it, but I heard it. <laughs> Three questions for you. Um, what was the purpose of miracles? Right. Don't answer that. What was the purpose of this miracle? Peter and John took a man who was well known in a public place and performed a miracle upon him that could not be denied. It's incredibly uh, powerful, immediate, and is it's just it's everywhere. It'll be a, a game buster. Uh, number two, would this sermon have convinced you? Would this have appealed to you? God of our fathers, our fathers Abraham, Jacob, and, and Isaac, God who promised these things. Moses is in there. All of the prophets spoke about Jesus. Jesus is the one that was promised, and now he came, and you killed him. You didn't do it on purpose. Neither did they, but you did. And now what do you need? What do you need to do? We saw him raised. That's what our job is. One more. Yeah, no, I heard it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3. With the coming of the, the Messiah, here's what's going to happen. Strengthen the weak hands and make the firm feeble. Say to those who are fear, fearful, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. All the prophets spoke about these days coming to this time, and you are here. That's a pretty cool moment right there, folks. Thank you for your time and attention. Lord willing, next week I will not be here. I am supposed to be in other, 